All right, going live, going live. <laughs> so the problem is no one's watching yet, so they don't no. know. Yeah, sorry. You didn't Paul. see the gag. They didn't see. I the saw gag. the gag, but no one else saw the gag. Okay. When does it start recording? I'll start recording at the top of the hour when you actually when we. I'll do a proper like like pause. Okay. Yeah. And I'll start recording because what I like uh -huh. to do is. Uh, I actually like to get some motion graphic and have a proper intro and then take the edited, edit everything together. And so instead of putting the streamed version up on YouTube, just have, um, have an actual produced version of it. So oh, everything has a proper like um, intro to it. There's a little bit of music, then there's the actual show. Um, hmm. But you don't get the... You don't get the pre-show or the post-show banter. You that's mm -hmm. you have to be live for that stuff. I see. Um, I see. Oh yeah. So we're we are live now though, right? We are like live. People, so now is the don't... time where we just wait for people. So, so anyone on social media you want to have show up, go tell them. Um, Slacks, whatever. Let's see, I can close this. All right, so it looks like we're streaming everywhere. That is, hey, yep, we're streaming on that YouTube. Uh, yep, so that YouTube's working too. All right. Yeah, people seem to really enjoy this talk uh, at RevCon, so I'm glad. I can I can bottle it up again. It's so it's it's so much it's so different when it's on a webcam. Yeah, I'm I'm your audience today. <laughs> For how to steal the declaration of independence with AWS step functions. So my next talk is going to be about uh, the event bridge, I think. I'll start working on that next week. And what the what a uh, Nick Cage film will that be? I'm I'm thinking it's going to be Con Air. I think it's finally oh, time because yeah. <laughs> it talks about event buses and there's like that yeah. entire sequence with. Um, or they're on like the the convict bus. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of bus imagery from that movie. <laughs> I'm just gonna be talking about event buses and serial buses and service buses. I also thought there might be a uh, a Keanu Reeves crossover with speed as well. I'm also going to post this in 757 dev because I don't care what those people think. <laughs> I mean, at least it's, you know, it's another local person on. So yeah. why, why the hell not? All right. all these twitch or these uh i hate when slack says oh you have five urls in your in your message i'm gonna go get the <laughs> display the thing one. for all of them oh ah. yeah you have to go delete them all all right actually i'm gonna pose so this is the one you did at revconf right mm-hmm All right. 
There we go. All right. Broadcasting in as many places as I could possibly think to broadcast right now. Okay. So we're on, we're on YouTube. We're on Twitch. We're on Facebook. Yeah. No one watches on Facebook. So, uh, was, does Twitter have its own Periscope? It has Periscope. I did not have much luck when I set it up. Um, so leave it alone. So we do have a couple people watching. We'll get a couple more probably over the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, but if you're out there in, uh, it looks like Twitch is the most popular at the moment. So if you're out there in Twitch land, say hi. Write something in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Oh, I need to join the Twitch in order to see the chat then, don't I? Here, uh, can I give you a chat? Uh, let's see. Jonathan, hi. I also set up a feature in Restream that, so not only is it supposed to connect all these different chats into a central chat for me, it's also supposed to rebroadcast other chats to other chats. So if someone's oh. chatting in Twitch, it rebroadcasts it to YouTube. Okay. So, so, I, like I, so I won't be able to see anything inside of the Zoom client is what you're saying. No, you won't. Um, ah, okay. I haven't quite perfected a shared combined chat. I don't know if Restream lets me do that. Ah, pause. Um, Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if you go to any of the chats, it will rebroadcast automatically between them. So it's not perfect. Like on YouTube, uh, Jonathan, who just chatted, he he comes up on YouTube as just a Twitch bot or um, not Twitch bot, Restream bot. So, mm. it, you know, it works well enough. So yeah. that way, if I say, well, John in chat has a question, people know who John is. Cool. I think I can pop out just the chat from the YouTube yeah. site. So if someone types on YouTube or Twitch, we can see it. Okay. Yep. Got it. What if I can close? Oof. This is going to be... Yeah, that's why real TV shows have like producers that yep. manage all this stuff. All this and then the on screen talent just has uh, ears on and um, it gets handled. Yep. <laughs> so this is this is fun banter. All right, all right, all right. So we got people coming in. Uh, how, how many participants we got so far? So far, I believe we have five, which wow, is a good number awesome. for not having started yet. Yeah, uh, couple, these are the eager beavers. Yeah. They're here and ready to go. Uh, so I just got back from the Kansas City Developer Conference, um, which is amazing event. So it's poly, not, it's a tech agnostic like, like Revolution Conf is, but mm -hmm. it's 2,000 people. Um, I think they had a little over 2,000 folks this year. Oh, and, that's a lot of people. Yeah. They, and they just take up a very small portion of the Kansas City Conference Center. And the Kansas City Conference Center takes up like two city blocks of Kansas City. It's a big co uh, convention center. Um, we're just using a very small part of it. And it's amazing. And so many people... But the problem with big conferences like that and is they have like 16 tracks going on at the same time. Uh, literally, there's you can choose one out of 16 sessions, which I think is great, except even at Revolution Conf where we had four tracks going on at the same time, people would always say, oh, I wish I could go to everything there were so many things that were hard to hard to choose. Well, it doesn't get any better when you have sixteen. At sixteen, you're just like, well, go dart. <laughs> which one am I going to go to? What? Uh, which one was your favorite? Uh, my talk. I only went to two talks. I went to the two I did. 
Uh, <laughs> I I did a new talk on uh, it was a mod modern architectural review of classic text adventure games. Okay. And, uh, it was eight thirty in the morning, the day after the attendee party, so mm. I was not expecting a soul. I had a packed room, standing room in the back, folks out the door, um, trying nice. to. Get in. And uh, yeah, for a brand new talk, I loved it. It was great. Uh, I might do that a couple more times. Is there a stream of it? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> there might be in the future. I don't know. That's a. It needs a little bit of polish. Nah, you want to just keep it exclusive. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> so I might do it on this channel if if I need to fill a week. But luckily, I don't need to do that. I have the next couple of months filled out with uh, nice. amazing speakers like yourself. Um, it's very so, exciting. Yeah, it's really easy when you know so many speakers in the space. Just go, hey, who wants to chat? And there's just a couple back and forth emails and people are on the calendar. So nice. Cannot wait. All right. Let me make sure. All right. So I have it running on my TV here in my office. So I know if it's working or not. And it is cool. But it's weird. Like on my screen, you're on the left and I'm on the right. Mm -hmm. and on the video, I'm on the left and you're on the right. How does this, let's see if I put my arm up, there's a huge lag between YouTube and oh, yeah. what we're, what I'm seeing even later. Yeah, it looks like it's a couple, a good number of seconds delayed. So no big deal. Well, we'll just count for that. I think Twitch is, might be a little bit faster, but you mm. have to imagine it's going from Zoom to Restream, from Restream to the other places. So it's not a direct feed to okay. wherever it's going. Oh, well. All right. About three minutes. Let a couple of folks get in. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, uh, you're in the pre-show uh, for the Swift Kick show. Uh, we're just chatting about random stuff. Well, let us know where you're from in the chat, whatever chat you're in. You're going to have to be my chat moderator. I will. Do so you want me to stop you in the middle of? Yeah, that's totally fine. To the end. All right. Cool. Yeah. If if people have questions uh, in the middle, um, feel free to to stop. It's actually, it's totally fine because um, with it being on the internet, um, it's probably better that I start hearing some questions because I generally like to get a gauge of the room. Yeah. You know, for skill levels and. Um, engagement so we'll uh if anybody here still has any questions feel free to to throw them out and then kevin can um flag it down and we'll just chat about it excellent all right i'll start record here in just a minute wait until Two right minutes. at the top of the hour that's when we'll have a lot of people jumping in all right and your video's gone, Paul, and your Paul? I'm still here. Oh. Are you still here? All right. That's kind of scary. He's like, oh, we're live. And then all of a sudden, Paul just fades. Adds to the mystery. It's like a Thanos snap. <laughs> Paul's gone. Didn't someone make a, a Thanos plugin that just erases half of your code arbitrarily? Yeah. Our code. I want to build one for Chrome that just gets rid of half my Chrome tabs. <laughs> Randomly. And we're back. And we're back. Yeah. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Let me hit the record. I'll kick the kick off the show and we'll, uh, we'll go into just some friendly banter and then you'll start talking. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, wrong button, wrong button, Kev. All right, record. 
to the class. Welcome everyone to the SwiftKick show. My name is Kevin Griffin. I'm the owner of SwiftKick. We're a software training and consulting company in Southeast Virginia. And today I'm joined by, I was supposed to be joined by Paul Chin, but where is Paul? Oh my gosh, it's Paul Chin Jr. How are you today, sir? Doing very well today, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on. I am so excited to be here. I just had to come up, you know, from underneath the desk a little bit. I know they've been working you hard that you just have to crawl on your desk, cry. I know how that is. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a new portal to a different dimension, actually. So it's quite comfortable under there. So thank you. Uh, Paul, I was, you and I were talking about this earlier, but I was really admiring your new headphones uh, because they look yes. amazing. Um, I, I'm a big fan. They, they almost remind me of some old shop uh, earmuffs my dad yep. used to have. That's yeah. kind of what they look like right at first. I, I definitely got these mainly because of the, the retro styling and um, they are the Sennheiser HD ones. Um, they're a pretty decent price. They sound great. And uh, yeah, they're not like the typical black cans. Yeah, oh, like, like I have on my, yep. Yeah. And so I, they even come in a, I, they even come in a, like a Pink Floyd, like special edition. That's got like a, a pearlescent coating on it. So my Very biggest cool. gripe with headphones. So these are noise canceling um, earmuffs, but the problem is I don't like wearing them over both my ears because I need to be able to hear myself talk. And mm. when I have them on, I can't hear myself. So there's no feedback loop. I end up talking louder than I really should, and <laughs> just throws everyone off. Um, the so that's why I have to wear them with one ear on and one ear off. Uh, I have another pair of um, noise canceling, uh, just head or not headphones, but um, earphones. So go in your ear. They do uh, real time feedback loop. Um, so I get the monitor in my ear while it's canceling out the noise which is fantastic for calls because I can hear myself and I can hear the other person, but I can't hear anything else. Love it so much. Uh, you need to re-implement the cone of silence for you for when there's calls. Uh, Remember that? Uh, get smart. Yep. Yeah. 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 I can't do the regular noise canceling headphones. It put too much pressure on my ears with like the yeah. Bose and the Sony's. Cause you can hear it. It's, it works really well on airplanes when there's really no noise around you, you can hear it pushing back. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, let's get things uh, kicked off. Well, Paul, you're a repeat guest. You've been on the show before. And if you are out there watching, you've never seen Paul on the show, go back through our archives on YouTube. Uh, so some folks are watching on YouTube already. But, you know, just for the folks who haven't been here before, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and who you do work for. Yeah, sure. Um, well, my name is Paul Chin Jr. I'm a solutions architect at CloudReach. We're uh, a global company that helps enterprises adopt uh, public cloud. We help them from you know doing the migrations to doing planning, uh, data and analytics in the cloud, and also application development, which is my specialty. Um, I came on the show. It was really exciting because I came on the show uh, almost like a year, a year and a half ago. Um, and did a whole thing about uh, serverless chat bots. And at the time, serverless was out and was a thing, but it still wasn't really big. And now uh, it continues to grow and it continues to mature. And I'm, I'm really happy to be back with uh, even more updated uh, serverless techniques. That's really cool. Um, so why don't we just go in and jump into it? Does this particular version of the talk have the hands-on component or are we skipping over that part? Uh, this does not. Yeah. That's not all right. So, yeah. all right. Be okay. At the end, we should talk about the really cool demo that you did because I, or unless you're going to talk about that during the talk. Oh, uh, so so the the fun the fun demo is actually a different talk. Oh, oh, my bad. But, all right, I got confused. Uh, if for all the new folks, uh, all of my talks do involve Nicolas Cage, so I could see where you could kind of start confusing a few of them <laughs> after they, a half they dozen look different. The same, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, we'll just go ahead and get it kicked off. Uh, folks out there watching, right. we're getting a good number of people coming in. If you're out there watching, uh, have a question, drop it in whatever chat you're talking in. And I will 
funnel it on to Paul when I have a chance to interrupt him. If not, just sit back, relax, and enjoy Paul Jin. All right. Uh, Kevin, can you just confirm that uh, people can uh, see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, great. And we're broadcasting live. So uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to tune in and, and hang out with us here for a little bit. My name, again, is Paul Chin Jr. Uh, this is a talk that I gave at Revolution Comp uh, a few months ago, and Kevin was kind enough to invite me onto the show. So if you didn't get a chance to come out to that awesome conference uh, and check out this talk live, uh, now is your chance to, to see it forever captured on YouTube. Um, what are we talking about today? Today, I'm bringing you a very, very special topic. Uh, how to steal the Declaration of Independence with AWS step functions. So what does that really mean? Well, uh, I wanted to first say that as application developers, we all make magic happen. Uh, I never want to discredit people who are working day in and day out to deliver business value, uh, to take a bunch of really vague requirements and then somehow cobble it all together um, after many meetings, many mock-ups, and many trials and errors to actually produce something of really great value. I think that's really important to uh, think about and hold on to when we talk about brand new technologies and, and new ways of doing things. Because so often when we're working with clients and they're trying to figure out how to adopt this new stuff, uh, they think we're just gonna throw it all out the window. Not necessarily, there's still a ton of value. Um, that's important to remember. So uh, if you've ever seen the show uh, called My Cat from Hell, it uh, has a, uh, a, uh, a host named Jackson Galaxy. And in this show, he takes cats that are uh, really difficult to live with and, and are exhibiting lots of behavioral problems uh, and you know, helps the owner and fixes it up. And one of the taglines of the show is, yeah, I'm not a bad cat. I'm just misunderstood. Uh, and the premise is that by understanding the fundamentals to, to feed and nurture and care for this cat, um, you'll be able to make this misbehaving cat into a better behaving cat. And I, and I bring this concept up because that's what we're trying to do with um, a lot of our clients in a lot of situations now when you're looking at public cloud and you're looking at cloud native technologies. It's like, I've got this app. It's not a bad app. Uh, it's just maybe not written in a way that is suitable to take full advantage of uh, the distributed computing power of the cloud. Um, so a lot of what we do is take these giant monoliths um, that at the time performed very well. You know, we didn't have um, really robust internet services. We didn't really have the kind of hardware and software abstractions to um, you know, pull these different services all over the place. You know, it had to run on a server. It had to run in a data center and all of your you know, remote calls all had to be on that database. Like I get it, it makes sense. So uh, never wanna have people think that we're bashing the older technology just for the sake of putting in new stuff. Um, and I bring up this slide because I think legacy is really important. Uh, here is a famous example of uh, a legacy problem. I mean, Nicolas Cage, he really wanted to be super mad. I mean, it was everything. And then him and Tim Burton went to try and make something great, but it didn't really happen. But what we ended up getting was this fantastic vision, um, a lot of neat behind the scenes stuff. There's an entire documentary for this, but that's again, not uh, you know, the best use of, of legacy and technical debt. So that moves us into serverless, the, the whole idea of uh, serverless architecture and serverless applications. And um, before I you know, jump too deep into it, uh, more and more folks now know about serverless, but they may not um, have fully played with it yet. And I wanna lay a, a ground 
level uh, rule of what serverless is. So it, it's definitely more than just the Lambda functions. I love Lambda functions. They are really the core of um, what makes serverless possible. The idea that you can abstract away uh, compute and run them um, separately from all your other application logic. Um, but serverless really is all about creating um, event-driven architectures where uh, different uh, services, whenever they change state or want to send a message, um, they're only going to emit events and they don't care who receives them or um, who's actually uh, where they're getting these events from. Also, what's important about serverless is you're only paying for the resources that you use. So you're not trying to over, over provision, um, which helps with your scaling. You're not going to try and um, create a, a situation where you have to have all this capacity just in case. The serverless architecture is going to create just the right amount of resources to execute your code to do the thing that you needed to do and then scale back down. And you only pay for what you use, which I think is a really cool way um, to make uh, applications mimic their cost centers uh, actually correctly. So if you're building out a new service and you have your consumers using it, you're going to be able to tell if your revenue from those consumers are matching the costs of the compute on the other side. Uh, and so when we're talking about uh, AWS and all of these cloud providers, uh, again, we're not really getting rid of anything. Uh, what AWS is actually able to do is, is take a lot of open source software, wrap it up into a service, um, and then give it back to us. And they handle a lot of the stuff, a lot of the management layers, a lot of the things that we as developers don't really care um, to deal with. And I always, I love this comic. Um, because uh, I made this particular comic uh, in response to when AWS took uh, and forked Elasticsearch um, and started working on their own version of it because the open source version uh, is still trying to make you know, their own money from uh, Elasticsearch, the parent company, and AWS just comes in and takes the open source now, forks it, and then resells it as their managed Elasticsearch. Um, product. So the whole time that we're talking about serverless and and, um, and cloud, we just remember um, that it's not really so much serverless. Yes, there are always servers, but it's more serviceful. What you're doing is consuming uh, layers of services from the cloud uh, providers. Cool. So what is a very simple serverless architecture look like, right? This is a very clean diagram. This is like serverless 101 from AWS. I mean, look at this. Oh, there's these nice, crisp, clean lines. What we're doing is uh, we have a web client. It makes HTTP calls. It hits uh, an Amazon service called API Gateway that invokes your code logic in an uh, AWS Lambda that might fetch some data from DynamoDB. You'll have an authentication call and all of your front end static assets will be stored in S3 and just start served up statically. Isn't that beautiful? Oh man, if only all of my applications looked just like this. So what are some of the typical use cases for serverless? Um, it's all about decoupling. I don't know if you can tell what this uh, diagram here is. It's uh, like railroad car couplings, right? Um, what it's going to allow you to do is break apart your application into logical services. Uh, each of those different areas can now be deployed, maintained, um, and upgraded all on their own release cycle. They don't depend upon the full release of uh, the, the whole application stack. Everyone can use um, the AWS services to front an API and then 
all of your lambdas will take care of um, your application logic. Uh, another cool use of serverless is for uh, seasonalities, right? Um, you might have a service that gets hit pretty hard on certain schedules and uh, you need all of a sudden a ramp increase in utilization for either um, like uh, parallel processing or for um, just tons and tons of compute, uh, loading lots of requests. Uh, in that instance, you don't need to have that kind of capacity all year round. You only need it for one or two months out of the year. And what's great is when you build your system like this, um, you can hit the lambdas a million times before you actually move out of their free tier. Um, so it's very, very cost effective for short bursty workloads. Um, they also, lambdas also fan out correctly uh, and work in parallel without you having to do anything. Every time you hit API gateway, it spins up a new lambda, it does your thing, it returns uh, some output. So there's automatic forever scaling sort of baked into how it works. All right, so you remember the nice clean diagram. This is kind of more like what actually happens. Um, in the actual day-to-day -day of building uh, serverless applications, we all know like, okay, we're gonna instantiate some API gateways, great. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so we gotta have some landings. Cool, and then, and then uh, well, we got to call the Dynamo like a couple of times, right? Um, and then you have these arrows that sort of go nowhere. Uh, and then your Lambda's timeout, uh, there's errors that happen. You're not sure if your gateway is getting, you know, the right request. So what do we do? We write more Lambda's, like we just keep writing more Lambda's forever. And uh, that's not really the best way to do it. Um, what eventually happens is we build our own Lambda monolith. Um, we have Lambdas that call Lambdas that call Lambdas. Everything is now coupled again. Everything is now uh, highly dependent on one another. Um, the other thing about Lambdas themselves is, you know, they have certain restrictions. Um, they're not going to be able to execute now for longer than 15 minutes. Originally, when they first came out, they were uh, limited to five minutes. Um, when they fail, they pretty much fail silently. They're only going to send, um, you know, errors to CloudWatch if you're lucky and you, you've actually written in your error handling into every Lambda. Um, the the thing that always comes to my mind, right? Like if a Lambda fails and there's no CloudWatch event, did it ever execute, right? Um, you know, there's all these ways that we've tried to think about how to architect all of these um, stateless functions. And so that leads us to this awesome uh, scene where we really have abstracted away all of the infrastructure, the server management, the OS patches, all that stuff. That stuff is all gone. But we're writing serverless applications, not stateless applications. At some point, you do need to worry about persisting some state. You do need to have some sort of workflow that can be orchestrated uh, and data that can be persisted and moved around um, as it gets handled for each piece of logic. And so now you have to repeat after me and do the chant and say, I am one with the state and the state is with me. And then you go and do really badass things like this guy. So, okay, we're, we're, we're not gonna write Lambda monoliths. Uh, we wanna get to a nice clean um, diagram uh, what are we going to do? So you could technically have a Lambda call Lambda. Um, you can use CloudWatch events um, to trigger certain um, event happenings on a Lambda. Sure. We could build our own um, SNS 
event system where once the Lambda is done, it'll call SNS. SNS will ferry that message to another Lambda and so forth and so on. Um, that's okay on, you know, really complicated issues where your lambdas are failing and you need to have, say, a branching logic. SNS gets a lot more complicated. Or we could, you know, take whatever uh, input comes in on the request, stuff it in Dynamo, and then the next lambda will try to go grab Dynamo or have Dynamo kick off another lambda or something like that. And still, that doesn't feel quite right. Um, I feel like the hardest part of doing all of the serverless uh, applications is still dealing um, with the database and scaling that correctly um, can be a bit tricky. So what should we do? So that's where step functions comes in. And if you've ever asked yourself, you know, um, how am I going to sequence my Lambda functions? How am I going to parallel these Lambda functions? Like say I wanna have um, two things go off at the same time and then merge the output again later. What do I do if I wanna do branching logic? Like if, if this, then that kind of thing. Uh, what am I gonna do when I wanna retry the function? And what do I do if I have to wait more than 15 minutes? And how am I gonna get better logging, better reporting, and a clearer uh, way to interface with the business, with this thing that I'm building, with this workflow that the business is asking for? Is there a tool um, that will let me talk to the analysts and the executives while also allowing me to um, build this application and do the engineering behind it? Funny you should ask because that's where step functions comes in. It solves all of these uh, use cases. But before I actually get into the real use of step functions, um, I know you all are on the internet, but I want you to close your eyes and, and feel the power rising inside of you that these step functions, serverless applications and Lambda functions are, are able to, to, to fill you up the power, what power am I talking about by the power of Nicolas Cage? Because I am not only a solutions architect for the incredible company of CloudReach, I am also a prophet of the one true internet meme, Nicolas Cage. And all of the tech demos that I do bring the latest and greatest uh, that cloud native development has to offer through the power of Nicolas Cage. And we will get to see step functions in all of their glory. So welcome, my brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Church of Cage. Here, we will get you past any fear or trepidation that you might have of building serverless applications. Uh, we will uh, empower you and build you up with the knowledge and the tools to be able to have workflows running serverless, serverlessly like a champ. Now, I want you to join me in the clouds, my brothers and sisters. I want you to feel the wind in your hair as you step off the on-prem data center monolith bus and join me in the clouds where all of your architecture can now be uplifted, uh, whimsical even as they become decoupled and everything sort of floating magically um, in the clouds. So yes, this is a little weird. Yes, it is a little strange to have um, Nicolas Cage here, but uh, I wanted to have a really cool example of the power of workflow orchestration um, with step functions rather than a very trivial sort of take the data from one place, put it through a transformation process, and then bring it to the last place and sync up some tables in the database. Now, I, like, I didn't want to have to do that to y'all. So if it's looking so good for you, I will continue going and preaching the great word of Nicolas Cage and step functions. So here we go. What are we going to do? We're going to steal 
the Declaration of Independence, when I thought about what is a workflow that really, truly, epically can uh, require the use of a state machine, I thought stealing the Declaration is going to be it. It is the greatest heist of all heists. Uh, in cinema history. So today what I'm going to show you is um, a new concept I came up with where you might have heard of infrastructure as code. I am now presenting to you movie as code. We are going to go through uh, how Dr. Ben Gates here steals the Declaration of Independence and we can build functions to do that. Uh, if you've never seen National Treasure, the movie that this is all from, uh, it stars Nicolas Cage as Dr. Benjamin Gates. Uh, he has a cool hacker friend uh, named Riley Poole, and um, the woman here, uh, Abigail Chase, is the intended target for the first step of the heist. We need her fingerprint in order to get down into uh, the vault where the, it, the Declaration of Independence is. And so we've got cool hacker guy and our savior, Nicolas Cage here. So how are we going to do that? Everything's event driven. Um, all of your serverless architectures, you should start trying to think about it in terms of events. Uh, things that uh, once a state has changed um, will then fire off uh, some notification of that event to another service, then pick up and, and do with it, with it what it will. Uh, it's kind of interesting now that all this event-driven architecture has been talked about for the last few years. Um, and AWS, just as of a couple of weeks ago, announced an enhancement to their CloudWatch events, and they called it the AWS Event Bridge. So it's, it's a really big deal. Um, it definitely takes some time to really sit and think and, and let it sink in on how we're now using um, the public cloud providers as the infrastructure, like truly the services that we now consume from AWS, GCP, Azure, IBM, Huawei Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, all of those uh, folks, we are now using it as uh, the infrastructure for our code. So it all starts with the events. And now at this event, in order to first steal the Declaration of Independence, uh, Dr. Benjamin Gates has to lift the fingerprint off of um, Abigail here and uh, use that fingerprint in order to gain access to the vault. And then a bunch of other steps. It's pretty complicated, but I think we're gonna get through it. So uh, how do we actually use these step functions? Uh, there's, they call it the Amazon state language. It's a you know, really fancy word for JSON. <laughs> I don't know why uh, they came up with their own term for it, but there you have it. Um, so the step function is initialized um, with a JSON and everything inside the JSON tells it what to do. Um, we have different state types. We have an input path, an output path. Um, there's integrations with other AWS services. So you can directly reference uh, S3 or Dynamo tables or the ARN of your Lambda functions. And also there's a cool visual flow um, that I will show you. So I'm going to swap out to the console. Hey, Kevin, can you just confirm that people can see my console? Uh, yeah, yeah, your AWS okay. console, yep. Yep, great, okay. So um, the first time you do this, I suggest that you go into the uh, AWS console for step functions and you can check it out here. Um, what you are looking at is uh, my step functions console and I've got uh, a state machine already created. Um, it's called the step function uh, steal step function machine. Uh, all this gobbledygook here was created by uh, my serverless um, serverless framework and I'll show you that a little bit later. But basically the meat of this, if I go to edit, is uh, here's that JSON I was talking about right here. And this is a, a really simple, um, easy version that you can see. Um, you have 
you name a state, it starts at this state. Um, and then you give it some type of task. Uh, and then you point it to a resource. And what this is doing is running this Lambda. So if you imagine the first part of the heist, it's like, I got to get fingerprint. And get fingerprint might actually be like a call um, to, to a database, or rather it, it's a call to an S3 bucket to make a copy of the object in the S3 bucket to another S3 bucket. So you can write your Lambda to say like, yep, go from one S3 bucket to another S3 bucket. And that's all that Lambda will do. Um, you should make your lambdas do one thing and one thing really well so that you can trace them down and compose them up how you want to uh, step functions. So um, now that you've seen sort of the most basic step function, what you can do is actually test in here. If I, uh, my lambda is set up to um, receive the response of message and say like, got fingerprint. And all this is going to do is uh, start the step function, pass in this input, and then um, you'll see what happens if it runs. Okay, execution status is succeeded. So that means every time your step function is, is run, it'll take some input and pass it down through this tree. Right now, this tree only has one point. And now what's really cool is if you'll see this uh, entire um, diagram here, you can actually take this and then show it you know, to your business folks. Um, you can show it to the people who are trying to generate all these requirements for you. They bring you some complicated workflow process where you, say, you sit down with them and you go ahead and whiteboard out the visual steps that are required. And then you can come back in, build the state machine um, using uh, your JSON syntax and be able to print out or show them on the screen exactly all the different nodes that their logic is gonna take them through, all the inputs and outputs. And what's really cool about this um, is that Amazon you know, typically doesn't have the best console experience. Uh, and to have this is really handy, to be able to show um, your non-technical folks how the code is being executed and in what order with what fallbacks and, and, and error handling, they'll really be able to sign off on the idea uh, and get ownership in it as well. And I just think that this is a, a really cool way um, to get the whole organization involved with this, this workflow process. And what you'll notice here is that there's an input, I sent message, got fingerprint, and there's an output. And then right now this output um, is returning a, a 200 message um, that echoes out what came into it. Um, you can make it even more complicated, you know, and actually uh, perform some database put. And then your output will then get passed on to the next step in the step function. So with this sort of basic stuff out of the way, I'm gonna go and show you um, the serverless framework. Now, the really cool thing um, about the serverless framework and the really confusing thing about the serverless framework is I keep saying the word serverless all the time. <laughs> and uh, really it could, be, it could have been called anything. Um, but initially when the, the idea of uh, Lambda functions came out, um, some really clever people uh, built a framework around it. Without the framework, you have to write your Lambda code, uh, put it in a zip file, upload that zip file uh, to AWS, um, and then manage all the versions, and it's, it's just a mess. Um, there are other frameworks out there now, actually from Amazon uh, recently, they came out with Sam. It's got a cute little squirrel uh, for a mascot. Uh, and then there's also a, a newer one that I've been um, experimenting with called Architect at arc.codes. All of them have you know, various um, pros and cons. Um, we use a lot of this, serverless framework, serverless framework um, here uh, with, with our team. And all you're doing here is declaring um, in a YAML file uh, what uh, resources you're gonna be using, where your Lambda handlers are. And then here you can easily declare your step functions and all your states. So instead of writing your JSON, you're writing this YAML um, and uh, it's a really great way to 
write your step functions, write your handlers um, all in one place. And then when you can go into your terminal and type um, serverless deploy and bang, it'll, it'll pack it all up, build the cloud formation templates, send everything up to AWS and, and you know, that can manage it. This framework can manage it for you with command line options, which is um, way better at scale and on a team and being able to version control. Otherwise, um, if you're just here, um, this looks great, but it's not going to you know, do any favors for um, your team operations. However, after you upload it with the serverless framework, you will still get this visual output. You will still get this visual flow um, that you can take and zoom around and everything. All right, cool. So now that I've gone through sort of like a, a lot of the technical mechanics and also, you know, uh, feel free to uh, message me on uh, on Twitter at uh, at Paul Chin Jr. Uh, or on LinkedIn, Paul Chin Jr. I'm Paul Chin Jr. everywhere on the internet. Um, and I'd be more than happy to share the code with you and um, answer any questions that you might have. Cool. So let's go back to the slide. All right, um, as I mentioned, the state language is just JSON or that YAML file that you input into serverless framework. Um, it's really good to know the different types of, of state types um, that are, the, the rest of this presentation will kind of focus on. Um, you know that you have some uh, a known input path and an output path that you can call um, and you get that awesome visual flow. You can do it. Look at Nicolas Cage pointing saying, you can do it. So this is this is all the different uh, task types. Uh, there's a single task state. That's the first and easiest one that we've seen. Um, and for simplicity, I went ahead uh, on this side showing the um, the JSON and not the serverless framework one, just so it'll match up with uh, the console when you're trying to play with it later. So we, we, we've gone into the ball, the event has kicked off, uh, we've started the charity ball, we're going, we're getting the fingerprint, we got the fingerprint, we've lifted it off of her glass, uh, and now we have it. So the next thing to do, uh, while Nicolas Cage is getting the fingerprint, his, his uh, sidekick, the tech in the van, is intercepting the video feed of the security system so that uh, Nicolas Cage can make it down a hall and all the security guards see is a, you know, a loop of an empty hallway. Uh, and this is a great example of a parallel task state where you, know, you have an event that kicks everything off and you have uh, an input that you need to pass on uh, later to get into the vault. But at the same time, you've got to intercept that security feed. So then you have a Lambda, uh, that is going to run in parallel at the same time um, that you're getting your fingerprint. And the state machine won't continue on executing until they merge back together later. So the fingerprint, if one of them gets done early, it'll sit and wait uh, and be able to pass on the outputs to the next event or to the next Lambda. And that's where we get here, enter password. So we've stolen the fingerprint we have it in our possession, we've made that S3 copy. And we've done the intercept video feed, which allows, um, which allows Nicholas Cage to get down the hallway. So you can imagine that's some sort of uh, uh, authorization um, or credentialing, right? Like you have to go get an object and then also do the credentialing at the same time. That's gonna be faster than doing them sequentially. So we do them at the same time. And once you arrive at that output state, um, you can now get to enter the password. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Um, with lambdas, it's uh, not as easy to catch the errors um, because when it fails, it's not going to, to do anything in your application. It's just gonna fail silently. So inside a step function state machine, we can explicitly say um, retry. We can explicitly catch the error and output it. And these outputs will actually be in the step functions console and in CloudWatch. And you actually do stuff with these errors 
as opposed to lambda erroring. Um, you can make it retry several times. Um, you can have different back off rates and a max number of times. And then once it, once it errors out, the, st the um, state machine stops uh, and then you can kind of figure out what goes wrong there. So we enter the password and if we get it right, we enter the, enter the vault and we're done. If we get it wrong, we send a message to say, get out of there and then we're also done. So the state machine will go through and execute and hit an end state that you know about so that you can handle it correctly. And this is one of the cool things that step functions can bring and add um, a ton of orchestration on top of the lambdas. So we did it. Ah, take a look at that. Basically, uh, once we enter the vault, um, we can add uh, another step and uh, right here we have type pass, which takes the inputs and passes it directly. Because once we've been inside the vault, there's nothing else left to do but take the declaration of independence and leave. Um, we haven't failed and we got it and we're out. So that's it. We did it. We found the declaration of independence, which leads us to uh, a map on the back of it to where we were able to find the spyglass to where we were able to uh, climb up into the church to where we were able to get down underneath the church and then find the treasure and repair bonds with our father and everything is great. And that, my friends, is extremely absurd. Um, this type of example is like super crazy and I totally understand um, that it was a little out there, but uh, I think it's a, it's a really great example of a complicated workflow with multiple different stages where it's important to uh, remember your input values um, and pass along the output values uh, in something that is inherently stateless like a Lambda function. Um, and so you might be asking yourself, well, how do we compose uh, these things and when is the best time to use uh, a step function because this example was so super silly. I'm glad you asked. Um, step functions really come in handy uh, with a known workflow uh, where you have to have very explicit uh, error handling. And there is gonna be times when you have to have, say like a, a person actually intervene. So you can imagine a workflow uh, that goes and gets some objects from S3, does some transformations on them, um, brings that transformation back out as an email or, uh, a web app notification, and then a human user has to approve it before it goes on. While it is waiting, um, you're not being charged uh, for that state machine. You're only charged um, for every state transition. So you could have four steps and that middle step takes uh, up to a year, I believe, uh, step functions can hold the workflow for up to a year. Um, so you can imagine somebody, you know, taking their super sweet time trying to approve this file um, to be able to go through and step functions will just sit there and wait and not charge you until they actually click okay. Uh, and then you get charged for the actual transition of state. So I think that's really cool. I think there's a lot of different um, really neat applications. And if you go online, uh, watch a couple of the other talks on step functions. Um, you can really see the power of it for orchestrating different workflows. So uh, did, did we learn what? Uh, huh? So I, I, a couple of things, uh, definitely smart, start small. Um, these state machines can get really big really quick, especially when you add branching logic and then you're back to square one of a highly dependent coupled um, legacy application that no one can debug or get through. So really learn to start small uh, and then try it in the console first so you know how it works and then move on to frameworks. That's what I tell people all the time when they start it, when they get started with serverless. Um, remember that the best parts of your existing apps still have tons of value, right? I spent a lot of time early on saying like there are no bad apps, there really aren't. Um, people and engineers make the best decisions they have at the time. And uh, that's something that I find that's very, very important to remember. And finally, have faith in the power of Cage. Try new things that are fun and then believe that you can do it. 
and truly believe that, you know, you, you really do make magic happen. And all of all the new things I try, I just let Cage guide me. And I hope he can guide you as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, be sure to, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter at Fulton Jr. Uh, give a shout out to CloudReach for uh, supporting, supporting all of this uh, nonsense. Um, we help folks uh, use the best cloud possible uh, and, you know, build cool serverless apps. Also hashtag praise cage. If you thought that this presentation was great, uh, quick plug, I will be at serverless conf uh, in New York in October with a, a different Nicholas cage talk about uh, the new web sockets protocol in API gateway uh, where I'm able to process oh, a million and a half events in the span of like five minutes and nothing falls over. So um, yeah. That's it. Uh, let me know, uh, chat, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns. Uh, if none of this made sense, if all of it made sense, if you now want to go build the best um, state machine you've ever created, just let me know. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and bring video back up. So give people um, oh, yeah. to ask questions if they want to. We had a pretty good crowd, hey. so I'm assuming one person out there has a question. Anybody? Come on. Uh, I know it was I know it was a lot. Hail Cage, that is correct. Yep. Dino Mech. I like it. Yes, praise cage. Be sure to tweet hashtag praise cage. Um oh, my goodness. Oh, I didn't mean the on. Oh boy, did I did I bore you, Kevin? No, you did not. It was just so much thrown at me. Oh, wore me out. Did did, did you have any questions, Kevin? Anything I didn't have any particular? Because I'm a pretty avid Azure guy, so you're talking a lot of like German to me. Oh, fair enough. Um, so for. Uh, State management on the, the the Azure functions. Are you using like Logic Apps? I think it is. Nope. No, I don't do any of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have a gentleman over your right shoulder. He's like looking in the door. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, what's, the, what's going on there, folks? The uh, the wonders of um, co-working spaces. Yeah. All right. Any Excellent. other questions? Yeah. Uh, be sure. Questions. So. Either that's really good or really bad. <laughs> you know, it it just kind of goes with the show. Like very few people ask questions. Um, most people, I think, just put it on the background and they listen. And, you know, that's all right. That's if we can help. Uh, John, Jonathan says, thank you. Uh, so that's good. Mm hmm. Well, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap things up and we'll move on to the after show. Uh, Ooh. So anyone watching live gets the after show. Uh, after show. So, Paul, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, thank you to everyone that joined live. We had a really good turnout across all of our different platforms. And if you'd like to catch the newest episode of the Swift Kick Show, go to our YouTube page and um, you can hit the subscribe button and you'll get notified when we put up new shows. Um, and we also put up the event. So before the live event happens, we'll put up the show. You can hit remind and you get a notification whenever the show goes live. Uh, but we'd love to have you at future shows. We're also on Twitch. We're also on Facebook, but really no one watches on Facebook, so it's okay. Um, we'll see you all next time. Again, Paul, thank you so much. Hit that like and subscribe button. Praise Cage. <laughs> Praise Cage. All right. We are now in the after show. Yay. After show. All right, so we got pretty Party. decent crown. I was kind of watching the numbers. Uh, I think you peaked around 15, 16 people. Um, okay. Live concurrent, that's good. That's a really good number. That, that beats our old record of like two uh, when... Yeah, yeah. When it was just me and uh, or the webinar jam platform. I canceled that. I was done with it. Mm. So this just works so much better. Uh, but... 
cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, um, hopefully that helps somebody out there and they'll be able to watch it later and you know, whatnot. I remember taking like an entire class on state machines when I was in college. Um, like it's, it's a super important concept um, that like everything you do is built is based around state machines. Um, uh, that was the big deal with the Turing machine. Um, mm -hmm. is that it was just one big state machine. Uh, and when they, uh -huh. yeah. Dynomech. Uh, so a gone in 60 seconds talk is actually the next talk, uh, that I'll be building using, uh, AWS event bridge. Cause I'll be talking about, uh, the event bus and what other bus is even greater than the, um, and the, oh, gone in 60, I do have a gone in 60 seconds one, actually. Uh, so gone in 60 seconds uh, is an ETL story where um, every character in that movie was matched to an AWS service. So the actual crew stealing the cars represents the lambdas that are moving data from, a, from one warehouse to another. <laughs> Do you have like a, a set of notes of every Nick Cage movie and just going, all right, this one makes sense. Yep, actually, yeah. Uh, when I, I do travel for um, uh, quite a bit and when I'm on the plane, I'm always watching a different Nicolas Cage movie. It has 92 credits. Why don't like, you start a streaming service where you, you can sign up and watch every Nicolas Cage movie at one low monthly cost? Whew, yeah, I don't. Start it, start it like, like grassroots uh <laughs> really really illegal i mean <laughs> just rip copies of all these movies put them up on a, some sort of share start the streaming service charge like a couple bucks a mission and then you know once the lawyers come in and go well, uh -huh. we got a thing here hey nick you and i should go into the business <laughs> I actually had feedback from from one person uh, that said I have to be careful with all of these Nicolas Cage references because like his lawyers are going to come after me. And I said that's a fair Let risk. Them. That's a fair risk. Uh, and I'll be the most famous developer in all the land. <laughs> <laughs> because that would be a great morning if you wake up and go, I just got a cease and desist from Nick Cage's lawyers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You yeah. made it. Uh, but yes, uh, I have our, I do have one with Gone in 60 Seconds, uh, which is really cool. Because I, I even use the, uh, the one character um, who, Otto, who has to uh, write all the names of the cars on a whiteboard mm -hmm. and cross them off as the cars are being loaded in the warehouse. He's basically uh, the SQS function, right? He's putting all the cars on a queue and managing when they come off the queue. And so uh, that's just a small taste of how I talk about ETL. <laughs> very nice all righty well paul thank you again and my pleasure thank wrap you wrap it up there thank you everyone who's out there watching live and you know, we'll see you all next time um i don't even know what our next show is i have to go look um but in uh, two weeks we'll be back all right well paul take care thanks kevin appreciate right. it have a good day see you all later Bye.